Hello, everyone. This is um, Ali Sieratan from thinkingandproductions.com. Oh, I could remove these. So um, this is an update on what is about to happen, which is a strike against the Islamic Republic in Iran. Um, there are uh, There's been a whole story that has led us to this moment in time. And for me, the story begins since... This was just the uh, the Jewish people just uh, observed the appointed days of the fall, um, the Feast of Trumpets, um, the uh, Day of Atonement, uh, which just ended, um, and uh, the beginning of soon there'll be the eight days of Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's interesting because you know, leading to the Day of Atonement, there is this idea um, that some of the traditions that comes um, from the observing of these things, uh, you know, in, in the Jewish world is born of kind of meditation on, on, you know, what is being said here, what's being done here. The idea is that the, the Feast of Trumpets um, announces kind of a period of 10 days um, where um, one must forgive, must one must you know look inwardly, let go of things, forgive people, and ask for forgiveness in in expectation of the day of atonement, where you know there is the 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 fast and the idea of um, asking forgiveness from God and having one's sins covered and then being written in the book of life for one more. Uh, year, uh, of course, you know, in the uh, tradition that uh, um, the Christian tradition that came from uh, from Jesus um, and his disciples, who who by the way were all Jews. Uh, for instance, this idea in the Book of Revelation, where there is such a thing as the Book of Life, Sefer Chaim, it's a tradition that predates the Book of Revelation that already existed. Um, and and the idea that you know I think Paul says that those that God predestined, uh, you know he he also justified, sanctified and glorified. So there is this idea that there is a book of life. Um, regardless, the this period of ten days leading to it is often seen as a time of judgment, where where in a way you know you you're kind of preparing yourself for that day of atonement so you don't receive you know a negative judgment that your sins are forgiven but it's a, it's seen as a time of judgment as though um there's a weighing in the scales and the heavenly scales leading to this you know yom kippur this day of atonement and i find it interesting because when we look at the prophecies concerning the messiah um the um feasts of the spring were were uh, very important for 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 the Lord. You know, he was uh, uh, put on the cross, uh, the tree of sacrifice um, on Passover, uh, the Passover lamb, the whole idea that, you know, he lifts up the, the cup uh, during the Passover meal and he says, this is my blood, the third cup of wine that represented the Passover lamb. And he says, he injects himself in the story of the Passover. He becomes the instrument of, redemption from the gods from bondage to the spiritual authorities um, that are over the nations including over Egypt and the freeing of people to to walk into the resurrected life into to enter into fellowship you know at Sinai uh, with the with the God of gods and to receive the instructions and and this whole passage from Passover to um uh, the the feast of Shavuot to the the Pentecost, which is when uh, you know Jewish tradition believes the Torah was given at Mount Sinai, is when of course the Holy Spirit comes, and the instructions of God are written in the inner temple as as evidence, you know that that the sacrifice offered was accepted. Uh, you know how do we know it was all real? Ultimately, yes, because the scriptures uh, agree. Uh, with the account, um, you know that's that's how the the four gospels are written. They they record the aspect of the Lord's life that uh, falls within um, harmony with with the Hebrew Bible, with the Tanakh. But ultimately, the idea is that not but but and that the the spirit of God is released from by the Father, 
as as you know the high priest enters the heavenly temple and presents the full work of the resurrection um and and there um the holy spirit is released starting with jerusalem on the feast of shavuot and from there into the nations and begins the toppling of the rule of these spiritual authorities as people uh, receive uh, the messiah they pledge allegiance to him and they enter into fellowship with the living god the monotheistic world begins and so the fall feasts are often seen as being related to the second coming because um, they, nothing you know special happened on them in the first and the there's a very famous prophecy uh, uh, that i often like to refer to in zechariah chapter 14 um, that clearly talks about the beginning of the messianic kingdom and the end of this age and it happens on the feast of tabernacle on sukkot where the nations it's it's just like the fall in the holy land you know it's it's based on the agricultural cycles of the land it's the ingathering of the people of the nations to worship the king of kings, but it's also um, uh, the ingathering of, of agricultural ingathering. But it's not just the, you know, it's an allegory for the ingathering of the nations. That's what Zechariah chapter 14 clearly says, that the, that the king comes and he defeats the enemies of Jerusalem. And there um, all nations have to come to worship him in Jerusalem on the feast of Sukkot. So... So that clearly says that these three appointed days of the fall that are so close to each other in in the month of Tishrei, um, in the seventh month of the of, of the year, that these clearly are related to the events um, uh, of of the establishment of the messianic kingdom and and the healing of the world. And so I find it interesting that. In this time, that's uh, you know, you think, well, what about the Day of Atonement? I mean, wasn't that somehow related? I mean, the whole idea of blood being offered on this one special day, uh, where sins are forgiven, where um, you know the holy uh, of holies opens for the high priest to enter, and then of course the New Testament says that you know that 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 Jesus was not only the sacrifice, but he was also the high priest, and he ascended to the heavenly temple isn't this related to him in some ways yes but it's interesting that the day of atonement yom kippur has a double meaning it's also a day of judgment because of course you know your sins are weighed you're atoned for you're forgiven in the blood sacrifice but you're also judged um to be forgiven but also those who are outside of this covenant receive judgment instead of forgiveness and so it's um it's an important day for forgiveness and for judgment. So it's possible that when he comes, you know, he judges the world. Uh, he judges the nations on that day. And and by the time we get to the next appointed day, this the Messianic kingdom, the wars that are prophesied, the nations that come in the valley of Jehoshaphat, and it says in the book of Joel, the valley of judgment, as they come, they kind of, you know, are being judged and then defeated, and then the Messianic kingdom is established. That's kind of the picture we see, I think, in the prophets. So what's interesting, and also in the book of Revelation, he comes as the uh, leader of heaven's armies, Adonai Tzvaot, you know, to to, um, to war uh, with the nations, continuing what the prophets uh, had already established, but the book of Revelation always gives more insight uh, it's like the next next level of insight opening up to things that were already established, not to replace them or to rewrite them or to create a new account, but to give more window into it. So I find it interesting that it was around this time last year that the president of Iran came to the United Nations and he made a speech as usual in negative about Israel, and he even had a copy of the Quran that he waved around. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting because... Shortly after, th this was in the month of September, shortly after he, he did this speech and his speech fell in those 10 days, you know, between the, the Feast of Trumpets, which is often also called Rosh Hashanah, but it's really the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, and Yom Kippur, this period of where, where, where judgment is given. And I think that it kind of may fall actually in line with the Lord, the, the trumpet is blown, the shofar is blown, and it announces that the king is is here. He's come. Perhaps you know some see that the rapture happens at the at that feast, and then 
there's judgment, you know, begins, the wars, the nations are gathered against Jerusalem. And by the time we get to the Day of Atonement, it's, 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 it's a salvation for his people. Uh, and all of Israel will be saved, it says, uh, and, uh, Paul says that, and the, and, the, uh, and the deliverer will come from Zion. And, and then, so it's, but then it's judgment to the nations. So it kind of does have that feel that these, these 10 days may be kind of this, the process of judgment and then the messianic kingdom established on Sukkot. If you look at it that way, so the president of Iran comes and he delivers this speech and it looks like some sort of a judgment falls on him because shortly after he leaves, the events of October 7th begin. And in the story that unfolds after that, that man who came to the United Nations to give that speech, of course, falls from a helicopter and dies out of the sky, out of the blue. And it's a mystery to this day. Him and his foreign minister, they go to Azerbaijan to inaugurate a dam. And Azerbaijan is at this point an ally of Israel. And But it's on the, the dam was on the border of Iran and Azerbaijan, so he went there to inaugurate it. It was a joint venture. But while he was there, he and the foreign minister made... Well, the foreign minister, no, but of course, he, his foreign minister fully supported the war and was in charge of a lot of things against Israel. But the president race, he just took that time to make a very anti-Israel speech. And then um, he said that one day he hopes that Azerbaijan will join Iran in its fight against Israel. And then he got in the helicopter, and of course, he died. And, and it's a mystery how that happened. There is no, you know, maybe it was an act of God. There's all kinds of theories. You know, he was in the same helicopter that brought him. He was in a different helicopter. There were some old helicopters that were 50 years old, and there's some newer ones. On the way back, he was in an older one. You know, it has four, uh, not it has two rotators instead of four, and um, he doesn't have the latest, you know, equipment. Um, um, there was some bad weather. It's true. There was a huge patch of clouds in these mountains there's all kinds of theories you know no was he carrying a pager that's uh, the theory that later people threw around but it but it's not true he wasn't so it's it's very difficult to understand you know what happened but it, but he fell from the sky and died that is what really we know for a fact and so so this judgment i mean he he was kind of very that was very symbolic and so I thought, okay, maybe it's the fact, maybe Iran has been, the Islamic Republic has been judged, and there's something that's going to come at them. That is what I thought when he came in that period in September, he made a speech. I thought that after October 7th, uh, and I put it in, in one of my first videos, I think the signs, uh, that there are a lot of things that, you know, fell into place, like, for instance, the fact that the um, uh, war started on this whole eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacle, the very feast that the Bible has appointed as the beginning of the Messianic Kingdom becomes the moment of attack. And it's 50 days after the last war, uh, which was a war of nation, not a war of militias, which was on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. But And then, of course, a great judgment was given against those enemies, and it led to an armistice with Egypt. And so I thought, okay, will this lead to some sort of a change in the Islamic Republic? The uh, 50 days, 50 is usually a, a sign of jubilee, the year of jubilee, where inheritance is returned to people. And um, uh, and so I thought maybe, you know, people feel in Iran that their country has been kind of hijacked by a group of uh, radical Islamist ideologues. And, and that's a feeling that has grown uh, over the past few years, I've seen it grow and grow to the point where that's one of the main, you know, feelings. So, so it's like, okay, there is this this idea that the, that the nation needs to be returned to its actual people who want now an Iranian Iran um, rather than an Islamic Iran, and um, and then of course the 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 fact that the eighth day of Sukkot, which eight is is often for me the number of new beginnings, since there's seven. Uh, days of the week, and then, you know, the eighth day, uh, the eighth is the, the day of the new beginning. That's also when a child is circumcised on the eighth day. Um, and this whole um, um, idea that the eighth day of Sukkot is also Simchat Torah. It's when the, the ancient lectionary of Israel resets, and the last, you know, words of the five books of Moses are read, and then the beginning of, of the 
of the book of Genesis is read. So it's like a new beginning. And, and so for me, there's a lot of signs of a new beginning, like, you know, the 50, um, the eight, uh, it was, you know, the, 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 of course, when the Torah shifts to the beginning, it begins with the book of the beginning, which begins with the words in the beginning. And, and then there was this idea that um, the, a week passed and, you know, there was a, there was an eclipse on, uh, that suddenly appeared um, on, on the, uh, on the Sabbath that followed on the week after. And so for me, there was a lot of, um, um, a lot of um, uh, symbolism of new beginnings at a time where um, Biden, MBS from Arabia and Netanyahu were, all heralding a new Middle East was about to emerge as as Israel and Saudi Arabia were going to normalize. Um, so suddenly, I thought, okay, well, what if for the new beginning to come, some great evil is to be removed, you know, from the Middle East? That's how the new beginning comes. God has His own idea of of a new Middle East, and that's one in, in which the forces of jihad are weakened. And a great and dark evil is removed. And, and as, as we saw about the hostages, I thought, well, it's as though the entire Middle East is taken hostage and and needs to be delivered. And so the war eventually focused on the Islamic Republic in Iran, which has the seven front war against Israel. And I've talked about the Prince of Persia, and I'm writing about this, so soon you'll 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 get a book out about this. The the idea that the book of Daniel says that there's a principality behind the 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 scepter of rule uh, of of uh, you know the prince of Persia. He's called, even though his lands are are vast beyond the Persian Empire, beyond the Persian uh, the current Iranian you know boundaries. This 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 principality has this huge focus, and of course there is the idea that there is the spirit of the anti messiah in all of these, whether it's Islamism or Marxism. These ideas that are given braided together to come to come against Jerusalem globally, and we read in the very ancient lectionary, uh, you know, on on the week of the attack, that that the word Hamas appears for the first time in the ancient lectionary. It says that 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 Hamas filled the earth, and we saw these protests come everywhere. Like the spirit of anti-Semitism just, you know, exploded in the entire planet. Um, like the prophet says, all the nations will gather against Jerusalem. Now you can see how, because the will is there. And this is, of course, this idea of, of judgment. So the prince of Persia and you know, attacking seven fronts. And, and then, of course, when Israel comes into the war, there are so many miracles that have happened uh, on the side of Israel. Um, incredibly vicious attacks that were thwarted. The, and and discovered um, suicide bombers that whose jackets blew up uh, inadvertently when they were on their way to major attacks. Um, um, launches from the north that were coming that were uh, going to be horrible, but but discovered and thwarted plans uh, that the commandos had made in the north to come and kidnap people and take them into tunnels that built that was thwarted. I mean, there's so many miracles that happened. Of course, the fall of of Hezbollah in such a quick way, you know, they haven't quite fallen yet, but their power was diminished within 10 days, again, uh, from the from from the pager attacks and all that. So so there's really, you get the feeling like the prophet says, Daniel says that 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 the one fighting for Israel is Michael and his angels, Sar Israel, the, you know, the, the leader of the, the scepter of power in Israel, and of course, Sar Paras, this, this creature, this principality that's behind the, the, the Persian uh, power and 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 Daniel says that this will be for later times this prophecy of this war and so and so there is this feeling that there was something spiritual and, and dark coming uh, on an appointed day of God uh, to challenge in a way the will of God uh, as he leads history into the direction of the Messianic kingdom and that full redemption of the earth and healing of the world. And um, as I've mentioned in my last video, which unfortunately uh, was taken down for reasons that I've never, you know, I don't, I don't know, uh, the, those it was not valid. But uh, the, uh, you know, I, I had some footage playing uh, from my Twitter feed that I commented on. 
And then I just left it there and I kept talking more and more. And then they flagged it and they said that what I was saying and, and what was on the screen were not in agreement. This was a wrong, it, it was just, it was nothing more than just slander. But I did do a topography of the spiritual landscape, you know, that that a lot of the attacks from the north were coming from Mount Hermon, from the Becca Valley, and from towns such as Tyre and Sidon, which are flagged in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 28 as places where the judgment of God is going to come. These are Shia strongholds of the Hezbollah. And, and they're coming against Jerusalem. They're coming against Nazareth. There was huge bombardments against Galilee and against Jerusalem. And there were, you know, missiles flying from Mesopotamia, from, from Babylon, from, from Baghdad, from that area. And then there's the Prince of Persia. It's You can look at it through a modern kind of um, map and you don't see these things. But you got to remove that and understand that the Bible has its own map of these places. And so... When you kind of uh, look at it that way, you really see the spiritual nature of the war. And now the idea of judgment and salvation and these things now makes a lot of sense. So Netanyahu then goes and makes a speech to the United Nations saying that, that there's going to be a judgment against those who curse Israel and a blessing for those you know, who bless Israel. And he takes that from both, of course, Genesis chapter 12, uh, where this is spoken over the Abrahamic covenant, the covenant bearers are shielded, you know, to carry their mission through history. But also he takes it from the very lectionary reading of the week where he makes the speech, where curses and blessings are spoken as the uh, ancient Israelites are headed towards the promised land. And and so this idea of curses and blessings, then he comes down from the stage and they tell him, look, we know where Nasrullah is. Should we take the strike? And he says, take it. He gives the order from his hotel room in New York. And and there immediately, you know, the leader of this militia, which is kind of a small version of the supreme leader of Iran. He's like, he's like a mini, mini version of him. If you want to look at it from the point of view of like omens and things like that, you know, in the sense, you know, in the sense that if you, you what are the signs? Well, well, I think when President Trump killed um, General Soleimani, that was a very important, with hindsight, and I see now that was really the beginning of this fall. Then Nasrallah, when he died, and, and also in the bunker, there was General um, Neil Faryan, who had replaced General Zahidi as the head of Unit 2000. Basically, you know, in, the um, Israel had, had destroyed a building in in Damascus that led to the first salvo of mi ballistic missiles and drones that were sent in April by the Islamic Republic, that's because he, they killed General Zahidi. And that guy, he was the head of the unit of the IRGC, was in charge of orchestrating the northern front against Israel. And so he was replaced by a new guy, uh, Commander uh, Nilu Faryan, and he was in the bunker with Nasrallah. So he was a high-ranking IRGC uh, official, and the head of Hezbollah. So when they died on that one strike, after the speech of judgment, you really felt like, okay, this is accelerating, you know, the, the judgment that's coming against those who, who are fighting. And on the ninth of the month of Av, which is the day that the spies brought the evil report uh, about the land, and they said, look, there's Nephilim in this land, there's the sons of Anak, and we can't kill these guys. And, and so that became kind of a lack of faith and a, a, always a negative day. You know, the temples were both destroyed on that day by the Babylonians and the Romans. And to this day, the Orthodox fast on that day, hoping that, you know, nothing bad happens. But there's a prophecy in Jeremiah that that these fasts that are, that are done on these days that are negative are going to be turned into joy and change. And it just so happens that this year on the day, on the 9th of Av, Hezbollah and, and the Islamic Republic were about to attack, and there was an earthquake in Lebanon and Syria on that day, which is always a sign of judgment, earthquakes in the Bible. So so there's this idea of the judgment is falling, and now the question is, the, now that Netanyahu has decided really to take the war to, to, to the 
to Tehran, to the God, to the to the center, the Prince of Persia, the the power that's behind this. And of course, you know, we have the idea that Michael is supporting Israel and his angels, and maybe that's why there's all these miracles and you know all these two hundred ballistic missiles were just thrown at Israel, and no, not a single person was killed. A Palestinian was killed. I think two Jordanians were killed. Five Iranians were killed. They the they were as they were preparing to launch the missiles, it backfired on them. So it's it's really interesting how um, there's this protection, and now is this the time where the judgment is really going to fall on the Islamic Republic, and it's going to start deteriorating their power, and a blessing may may come on the people of Iran because I've mentioned I made a video about this whole thing that you know of all the empires that came. Um, against Jerusalem, whether it was the Egyptians, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, you know, the Greeks, the Romans, they all kind of, you know, were cursed Israel and they all were destroyed. Even the Romans who who destroyed Jerusalem and the temple and scattered the Jewish people to the four winds, they were, Rome was destroyed and cut into small pieces and scattered. Um, but one empire, the Medo-Persian, the Persians and the Medes, they actually you know, blessed the Israel. They said, yeah, go and rebuild the temple and kickstarted the whole project that led to, to even the Messiah, you know. So the lights, the whole, you know, were, uh, of the temple uh, were, re, were re, you know, re, reignited. Not not that it's like Hanukkah, but but it's still, the lights were off and they're turned back on. The the light of the, you know, the, of the God of Israel, you know, the, the king of Persia says, go and like, you know, rebuild the temple. And then another king says, you know, go build the walls of Jerusalem so that you have security. That's what Nehemiah uh, who, who is able to do because he worked for the king of Persia as the head of his, like, you know, CIA, if you will. And and then, of course, another one of the kings, he killed the last of the Amalekite, uh, the son of King Agag. And, and he could have listened to Haman. He could have listened to the enemies of the Jews, but he actually listened to... Uh, to Esther and Mordecai, who were messianic figures in that story, and so there was a lot of blessing. And some people say, "Well, then, then Persia of all the empires has earned itself a blessing." And I and I made a whole tape about this that there was a minister of defense from Israel, um, Shaul Mufaz. He was on a show from Jerusalem to Iran because he spoke Persian. He was an Iranian Jew, and then this woman called in the show at the end and said, "You know, we you you need to you need to you owe us a debt and you need to free us." And then this was in two thousand and three, and and we now need you. She said, "The way you owe us a debt, the way that we you were helpless, we are now helpless, and you you have the strong army in hand." And then twenty years later, in two thousand twenty three, when the uh, a minister of intelligence Gil Gamliel invited the crown prince of Iran to go to Israel, she said she was by the Western Wall, by the Kotel, praying, and suddenly an idea came to her that Israel owed Iran a debt and would play a hand in freeing the people of Iran. And and I I, I, and I was looking for the, that video because I saw it when it first came out. Then I lost it. But I found the video again of her saying that. And um, it's, it's amazing. Uh, you know, it's amazing that she says that. Um, I can kind of passively look for it as I'm talking if you want to see it as well. But basically, um, it has this, this time come of a judgment being delivered against the, the prince of Persia, against this, uh, you know, the, the Islamic Republic of Iran, where the scepter of Iran is, is hijacked or taken by this Khomeiniist force uh, that's, that, that, that is very much, you know, against Israel, wants to destroy Israel, because before that, of course, the Shah of Iran was an ally of Israel. Um, and he honored, in a way, the decree of King Cyrus. Um, so are we now going to see a judgment being delivered that begins the process of the toppling of the regime? Um, well, let's look at that. So first of all, it looks like it's certain, 100%, that Israel is going to strike. Israel has made no, um, uh, has not hidden its intention that it it hopes for a regime change. It hopes that this triggers. In fact, Netanyahu just made a speech to the Iranian people saying, guys, um, you know, we're not against you. It's against the regime. And this is your chance to retake your country. And the speech really had that feeling if he was preparing the country 
for a much larger action. And then suddenly, you know, they threw the missiles in, in response to Nasrallah's killing. And then, of course, um, he then uh, said, okay, he's going to respond. But that ran into these holidays, these which are not really holidays, they're holy days. And and this is a time of, of atonement, but also of judgment. And it, as I said, it may tie to the, the ultimate judgment because the Bible functions in a system of pattern it's very important to understand that there yes a lot of a lot of these patterns are in a way uh echoes of moments in time some in some some in the future that do though do involve the messiah and the final judgments against the nations and the and the beginning of a new age but but in a way thematically the pattern echoes you know through time, especially when it's so close to it all, we're in the birth pang years. The, these are battles literally against Jerusalem and, and the pushing forward of the project of God. There's been so much attempt to stop it going back to Hajj al Hussaini, going back to the war of 1948 and the wars that, that have followed since, you know, the 1967. I think this war ultimately will be proven to be about the Temple Mount whenever it ends, this war. Because that's what the enemy put its hand on, and usually, kind of might get reversed. So there, there's a moment where, where the project of God's the fallen tabernacle of David is rising, and there's a lot of pressure against it. So is this a time where we're going to see a judgment fall against the power, the government that was really behind all of this, October seven, that funded all the militias, that opened up a seven war front against Israel, and happens to be the seat of power of principality mentioned in the book of Daniel. And of course, you know, was this really Michael and his angels fighting for Israel, which has allowed them to have such huge, you know, advances so quickly? Well, we're about to find that out together. We're going to see if the strike of, of Netanyahu is going to trigger, um, you know, trigger a, basically the revolution in Iran, I would say, was triggered in 2022 by the killing of this um, Iranian uh, woman from the Kurdish tribe, uh, um, Mahsa Amini. And and you think, well, what was so special about that? Because uh, the regime kills, you know, Iranian women all the time. I don't know what was special about it, but it was as though uh, there was a cup full of blood and one more drop fell in it. And then the cup, like poured over and and justice it's like when abel you know when god says to cain where is your brother uh and where is abel and then cain says i don't know i'm, I'm on my brother's keeper and um and then god says the blood of abel cries out to me from the earth for justice that's the implication and so so this as though all these bloods cried out to heaven for justice and her her blood was like the fine and suddenly this this revolutionary spirit just poured into the nation. Everybody felt it until 2022. All the protests that have had happened in Iran were were really about reform. They weren't about revolution. There was always, of course, some people that wanted revolution, but but it, nationally the country wasn't like let's have a revolution. But in 2022, something happened, and suddenly the the spirit you know, nearly came. And I was like, a revolution. And it was going to be a marathon and for all kinds of reasons. But is it, and I can open it up for you. Um, I just don't want to get too, you know, sidetracked uh, from what I'm saying. But the short of it is that all the sectors of the society have to unite the middle class, the working class, the blue collars, the students, the, um, the opposition that is organized has to reveal its network, the People that are in the regime that are collaborating already with Israel, but but ultimately their goal is to turn against their bosses. They have to, you know, do that, and it all has to happen at once. And for that to happen, there has to be kind of a clear path to victory, and and that hasn't been there because the opposition leaders were always killed. Um, uh, or had to run for their lives and leave the country. There's an entire unit of the IRGC that's designed, that's the kind of ideological army of the Ayatollahs that runs the country um, and, 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 you know, commands all the militias. 
there's a unit that is designed entirely to crack down on any small cell that's created with revolutionary ideas to find them out and, and kill them right away. And then when people come out for protest, they really push it down hard because they're afraid of the floodgates to open. And there's it's leaderless, spontaneous protests since 2022, led mainly by students. And so for the for everybody to get involved, there had to be kind of this clear path to victory. And now the question is, is that path really opening up? After April, when the ballistic missiles were thrown, Israel felt, okay, they can live under this threat. Sooner or later, those ballistic missiles may have a nuclear uh, head cap. And, and, and there has to be, or major setback of that power in, in Iran or a complete collapse of it. But that, of course, it, it's the Iranian people that can only make that decision. Israel can only focus on its own security, but hoping that weakening the government would, of course, you know, empower the resistance to move. This became a real strategy. And and I thought I thought it was really interesting because this is this is where I saw the war going from the beginning. Um, you know, I I, I made a tape about the, the 50th year, that they're never gonna leave the 50th year, they're never gonna reach the 50th year, that they really it's it's the time of Jubilee where inheritance is returned. Yes, that that law applies to the Jewish people, it's part of the Torah and it and it was something that was obeyed in the land, but at the end of the day, the spirit of it may apply to to other people as well. And 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 of course the kind the the revolution will be fifty years old, um, in two thousand twenty nine. So I, I thought you know what these guys are never going to make it to fifty, because of this idea that it's true that that whatever you want to do to Israel happens to you. That's what the covenant of Abraham assures. The seal that's put over the covenant bearers uh, is that you know if if you uh, curse those. Uh, if you curse Abraham, then you get cursed. And if you bless Abraham, you get blessed. And and so whatever curse it is that you have will fall on you. If you want to destroy, you'll be destroyed. That's the idea. So that the covenant bearers go through history in a way protected by a shield. You can't destroy them, essentially. And then this is this is a blessing to the families of the earth, right? Because if all the covenants are with Israel and with the house of Judah, including the new covenant that's mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 31, that the Lord, you know, has initiated, of course, the fullness of it, it ha you know, is implemented at the second coming. And um, that new covenant is also with the house of Judah and the house of Israel. And it says that right there in that passage that should the moon, the sun and the stars leave, only then will Israel not be a nation before me, meaning that, it that you know, there is a security over these people who have this covenant. And of course, Paul then says the Gentiles are then grafted in while a portion of the Jewish people is kept blind so that a portion of the Gentiles can be given sight until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And now we see, of course, since 1967, out of the Jesus movement of the late 60s and early 70s come, you know, the Messianic movement of, of the Jewish people, like the first century, proclaiming Yeshua as the Messiah. And so there's a lot of things that are being fulfilled and now we see the rise of these powers and principalities against Israel and the judgment that may be coming from God. And so are we now at the beginning of that strike that could exasperate this revolution that has began in 2022 and lead to a regime change and the collapse of the mullahs? The very thing they, they intended for Israel may be coming to them. We're about to find that out. There's a lot of interesting information that's come out from um, the campaign of Israel into Lebanon. One thing is that the discovery that, that of in immense maps and documents that show that there was the Radwan team, the commandos of Hezbollah, were trained to take over towns in the north of Israel, in the Galilee. They were trained based on the topography of the cities and towns and villages and that they were going to target. They were trained to target and it was going to be a two-front attack, one from Gaza and one from Lebanon, to take hostages and take it back to the tunnels in, in the north are far more elaborate than the tunnels in Gaza. It's not this mushy sand, it's actually rock. And because Lebanon is a sovereign country, there has been like Chinese contractors and all kinds of people that came in and built those tunnels. Those are incredibly... And, and now we've discovered that there were tunnels very close to the border disguised in what appears as large homes and things like that. 
that that they were going to take the hostages and quickly take them into the tunnel system and disappear them. And this was going to happen together, one from the north, one from the south, coming together. But it seems that Sinwar or, or Hania, the guy who was killed in IRGC military compounds in Tehran, by the way, which shows the connection between people within the system collaborating already with Israel, that that guy decided that he was going to actually steal the thunder and go ahead. And that, that itself was a miracle because the intention of the enemy was suddenly shown beforehand, you know, maybe yet prematurely, because this was hatched in the mind of the supreme leader of Iran. He's the mastermind of this double attack. You know, he he funded it. Hezbollah already was under his command, and then he gradually brought Hamas under his command. Or maybe it was the plan of General Soleimani was killed by Trump, but the plan was hatched by a kind of the overlords of both of these militias, and that's why it was going to be coordinated. But that whole plan fell apart. In fact, after the whole pager incident, and when Israel went in, the Radwan team leadership got together in Beirut to actually activate that plan, and 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 Israeli intelligence knew about their meeting and killed all the leaders in one shot. So. So it's interesting, again, as I say, these, these miraculous victories of a small nation fighting these incredible forces and getting it all right. And so quickly, it's in changing the entire, you know, um, power structure in the Middle East because out of the Islamic Republic, out of this realm of the Prince of Persia, there was these militias called the Shia Crescent that went all the way from Afghanistan, actually, really from Iran, for sure, into Mesopotamia, into Syria, into Lebanon, and and when when the Arab Spring happened, the Islamic Republic said to uh, the Bashar al-Assad, the leader of Syria, "We'll secure your power, but you now belong to us." And he is he became the linchpin of the Shia Crescent from Mesopotamia to the Mediterranean. And when the Arab world withdrew from Hamas, the Islamic Republic went and said, "We will give you the money you need." But and we're gonna. They even planted their own militia in Gaza called the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which directly responds to to Iran as opposed to Hamas, which has its own leadership and works with Iran. And and this was called the Ring of Fire. You know, the Hezbollah in the north, um, uh, Hamas in Gaza, and of course, uh, mil favorable militants even in Judea and Samaria, the heartland of of of, of ancient Israel. And the, the, this was called the Ring of Fire. There was a Shia Crescent. And now that Israel has, you know, decimated Hamas and has, you know, weakened Hezbollah tremendously so quickly, killing the leadership, um, the, destroying about, you know, 80% of their firing power, blowing up the tunnels that resupply them from Syria, and now has entered, as of this uh, yesterday, into Syria, and remember, the earthquake happened in Syria and Lebanon. It's weakening the power structure of the Islamic Republic, which means that they are no longer can be seen by the world order, by the greater powers, the United States, Europe, Russia, as custodians of security in that region. Because the truth is, as I've said before, you know, the Middle East was divided into two uh, religious organizations that run and control the resources of a few nation states. The Islamic Republic controls Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria, and the Muslim Brotherhood controls Qatar, um, uh, Turkey through the AK Party uh, of Turkey, the new Taliban, in Afghanistan, and half of Libya. And and there is deals made with these two power structures, uh, mainly by Obama. And these deals are economic deals. The idea was that this was a whole political philosophy that came out of the universities which I suspect were Marxist, and I think that's one of the spirits of the anti-Messiah, because both Marxism and Islam seek to replace the vision of the Messiah and of the Messianic kingdom with their own, you know, vision of the future. And these guys come at come at through the university system, and they kind of tell the Senate when Obama was senator that you know you should really there should be a deal made with these two power structures. It doesn't matter what they do to their own people, that's not our concern, or even what they do to the Jews. What matters is global order. And these guys right now are controlling the region, and, and under them, energy and goods are flowing. So that's what matters to us as a global power, ensuring kind of global governance um, and, 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 and global economy, including, of course, uh, the American economy, the uh, 
uh, you know, the, the biggest economy in the world. And so this is what you should do. And Obama, when he became president, he kind of implemented these deals. He even made a deal with Morsi when he went to Cairo, who was the head of the Muslim Brotherhood, because that's where the Muslim Brotherhood comes from, Egypt. But also he was the head of um, the president of Egypt at that time, democratically elected. And um, when you look at the Muslim Brotherhood, it's an organization that um, was founded in the 1920s and um, the supreme leader of Iran, the founder of the Islamic Republic of Iran, Khomeini, he went to Egypt. He met with the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood. He was inspired by this form of expansionism of Islam, of reclaiming a rule of Sharia law in the modern world. Um, and um, he, the, 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 there was a, a Council for Muslim Unity formed in 1947 you know it's like it, it's like it's like the enemy moves forward exactly with god because 1947 was the very year that the united nations gave created said there will be a modern state the state of israel the and the league of nations agreed to that and that was the fulfillment of a prophecy in isaiah 66 that overnight a nation is born you know who has ever seen that a nation be born Overnight, and so suddenly, um, and it's in Isaiah sixty-six, and that was the fulfillment of that—the the birth of modern Israel. And so that same year, there was the Council for Islamic Unity between the Muslim Brotherhood and Khomeini, the guy who founded the Islamic Republic of Iran. He had a seat in that Council of Muslim Unity. Uh, so. The Muslim Brotherhood that controls these countries and the Islamic Republic, the Khomeiniists that control the other half of the Middle East, they have worked very closely together. And there's economic deals made with both of them because they're custodians of a region. The weakening of the militias and the pushback of the power of the Islamic Republic, not only is it is it making the Muslim Brotherhood stronger because you know the Taliban receive millions of dollars in aids from the United States and and there's been always support for the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, the, the head of the WEF just made a very big economic deal with the, the leader of Qatar. That's where, you know, America's main naval base is for the Middle East. And that's where um, the hostage negotiations were going through Qatar. So there's a lot of connections in, in, in as far as empire is concerned and the Muslim Brotherhood. But now that the sheer... Um, infrastructure is weakening as Israel is destroying it, it becomes easier to convince the world order that these guys don't have it anymore to 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 secure their turf and maybe the world should start looking to some opposition, you know, inside of Iran that could secure that region because it's, of course Iran's a very important country geopolitically. Russia seems to be withdrawing a little bit. Um the um the reports that 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 Putin canceled his twenty five year military deal with Iran after the president fell from the sky and he definitely canceled the selling of the jets in two thousand and twenty three it looks like he's kind of waiting to see what happens before he you know hooks himself too much because on one hand, yes, Iran is part of his um um, block of power and it's an important ally and they create they make weapons for him for ukraine on the other hand historically russia uses iran as a bargaining chip it holds on to it and then he, it uses as a bargaining chip with it for its own problems with the global powers this is this is going back to the time of the british and all that uh, this is kind of a, a pattern of, of russian foreign policy towards iran and so russia may start to think hmm Maybe, maybe they're if if they have any leverage in this game, they can they can kind of say, okay, you know what? We'll withdraw from supporting this power in exchange for some sort of a deal over Ukraine. So we'll have to see. I don't want to make things up because what do I know what's happening behind the scenes? I want to stick to kind of the facts. but but I'm thinking out loud with you that that the weakening of the Islamic Republic's militias weaken them in the global power structure and make Israel's, you know, regional aspirations stronger, speaking from a worldly perspective, because now, let's say, for instance, right now, let's say if Hezbollah is going to be isolated and disarmed, and it's not there yet, but if that's the direction Israel is going to take it, then 
it becomes easier for the Americans to convince the French to step in and help the Lebanese people and the Lebanese army to stand up. Why? Because under the Hezbollah, Lebanon is in the Chinese, Russian, and Iranian power block. But if suddenly there was a worry that that if it, if Israel w went into Lebanon, it would cause a massive regional war because Iran had said if the if they step foot in Lebanon, they will launch a regional war. But not only did that not happen, but Hezbollah was immediately weakened. So now the West can say, "Wow, this is interesting. We can actually pull Lebanon with its Mediterranean access out of the hand of that other power block." So suddenly the the intentions of 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 global powers in their in their you know war of blocks with the Chinese, Russians, Islamic Republic, North Korea block on one side, and 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 the West on the other, led by the United States, suddenly they now see the weakening of the other block, as Israel is accomplishing incredible military victories against the Shia Crescent, they suddenly see an advantage to to that, and and they might say, well, what if you know, yes, maybe we can pull to pull Lebanon to our so the so the, there's maybe an alignment of interests forming between the global powers and and uh, and Israel for a moment. We'll have to see because you know uh, the president of Iran went to Qatar and he kind of made a um, Iran and Qatar share the same gas field, and it's um, in Iran it's called South Pars gas. It's like a big bowl of rock. And two straws are put in it, and Qatar and Iran have an agreement of how many, how much gas each one can pull out. And what Iran does, it allows Qatar to pull out more gas in exchange for political favors. So the Emir of Qatar, you know, the president of Iran went and saw the Emir of Qatar after the two hundred ballistic missiles were thrown to Israel, and Israel said they were going to respond. And and the Emir of Qatar was able to put pressure on the president of France, Macron to ask for an arms embargo against Israel because Qatar just gave 10 billion euros to Paris and um, um, the the sa the sale of LNG gas to Europe uh, to counter the loss of Russian gas has been a very big part of deals made with Europe, especially with Germany. Um, and so so that that may have been a result of the visit of the president of Iran to uh, to Qatar, and that's why Macron was able. So there is. I'm not saying that all global interest is against, you know, the Islamic Republic suddenly or for Israel. Not at all. Far from it. But I'm just saying that there that the weakening of the Shia Crescent changes the geopolitics of the region and how the world sees the Islamic Republic. Um, can it continue to be a custodian of power? Can it continue to be an important chip in the Russian bloc? If it's going to lose those things and weaken, then 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 global alignment may be changing against them. So the judgment may be coming at them from from the globe, and this is important. As Netanyahu now moves forward, now that the Day of Atonement is done, and everybody expects that the war, uh, the attack begins. By the way, just as the sun set on the Day of Atonement, there was a major cyber attack in Iran against the three levels of government, the legislative, the executive, and the judiciary. They're all attacked by cyber and the nuclear facilities. So it's possible that, that was the first salvo, that there was a cyber attack launched right away as the Day of Atonement began. But now that that is done, and now Israel's response is going to come, there are four targets, four target categories. There is basically um, the military structure of the IRGC, which is with their um, their military bases, their missile um, uh, launch pads. Um, and and of course, you know Israel, okay, that's one one possible strike and and technically because they, they that military attacked Israel, then that's the most logical uh, counter strike, you know is against the very, the very hand that kind of came at you. It's it's the most legitimate strike, if you will. Um, the other categories are the leadership of the country. There's been assassinations. The pre the supreme leader, he's in bunkers right now. That's been well advertised in Iranian media, media and echoed in global media. So his 
palace in the middle of town, which is kind of isolated. There's no houses around it. And it's got, it's like in a compound and it's got, you know, anti-aerial systems all around it. That is now empty. And it'd be very symbolic to, of course, to hit his empty palace, the leader of the country. Um, and then there's, of course, the oil reserves and about 89% of the oil of Iran comes out of these three you know, refineries or four refineries, but eventually comes to an island um, in the Persian Gulf. And, and from that island, it gets put on docks and ships and taken out. So, so you just hit that on one island and, and you shut down the oil, which is, of course, the financial um, um, resources of the government mainly come from oil and gas to fund their, their employees in the country and to uh, fund their militias and buy weapons and make weapons. And, of course, you have the nuclear sites. And so how are these things going to play out, these four categories, the nuclear, the oil, the leadership, and the military infrastructure? These are the four categories of, of strikes. And how is it going to kind of play out? Well, we're going to have to see. Um, um, there's been a lot of talk with the United States about these strikes as well. Some say that, you know, Israel is hiding its hand. And, you know, Biden has said no nuclear um, um, oil. No. Well, you know, the Iranians have said they'll hit the oil resources of the United Arab Emirates and of Saudi Arabia. In, ex in, in return, they'll return fire. Um, America just brought, you know, the Thad system and, and installed it in Israel, um, uh, w which kind of competes with the arrow system of Israel. It's a, who knows why it's there. Maybe it's there to protect the American naval vessels. I don't know. Um, and so there, there's been this idea of, you know, retaliation. If oil is hit, the oil markets would, you know, of course, react, um, and oil is not like electricity. You can't just press a button and somebody else now compensates for the loss of that oil in the world market, the oil price would go up and that's kind of the basis of inflation. So I think to myself, you know, hitting oil this close to the American election would be nearly considered election interference because inflation would take a spike, the bond market, which is the basis of, you know, um, mortgage rates and the basis of um, car leases and loans and furniture leases or anything you want to buy i mean it's it's the main market of of the western world's credit based economy is the bond market you know the bond market is three times larger than the world uh, uh equity market so it's a very important market it and but it would have to now bond, yields would have to rise because if the price of oil goes up then it means that inflation is coming back and interest rates would have to go back and stay higher to curve the effect of that, you know, in, in perceived inflation, the the fact that oil is the basis of all goods and you know move move with with trucks and vans and 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 trains and all of them require gas. So, so the idea is that that you, this close to the election, do you really want to affect the stock market of the United States? Do you want to affect the price of gas? Things that Americans mostly are focused on, rather than the Middle East. So maybe you want to play ball with one of your biggest allies and not hit the oil. And and nuclear, you might want to let it escalate because now that the militias are being destroyed in, in the Middle East, the militias were seen by the Islamic Republic as, in a way, their strategic depth, their, their shield. Before you can get to them, you have to go through all these militias. You have to go through Hezbollah with its 150,000 uh, you know, rockets and missiles, and, and they have very sophisticated missiles that can hit deep into Israel, and you have to go through Hamas, and you have to go through the Houthis, and you have to go through the 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 disturbance in the West Bank, and the Judea and Samaria, and you have to go through uh, Syria, and you know, if you can get all of these militias, the Zainab Yun, the Fatim Yun, the, the Shias from Pakistan and Afghanistan that have been brought into Syria to form these militias that Iran has, then you'd have to get to Iraq and fight the Iraqi militias that are under the command of Iran. Eventually, you know, you could get to Iran. So, so, so you don't need a nuclear. The nuclear is best used 
as a lever for negotiation. It's like this boogeyman that you always bring out. Oh, we're going to go for the nuclear if you don't drop sanctions, if you don't do this, if you don't do that, while you're slowly, ever so slowly continuing to build towards it. And maybe not so slowly, but you know, you're know, you kind of like keep yourself at that threshold where you have the option to leap for it or to use it as a lever while these militias give you the strategic depth and protection you need. But now that the militias are suddenly you know, falling much faster than anyone would ever imagine, including the leadership in this Islamic Republic, it does make sense for the government to now say, okay, we need to then uh, cover ourselves with a nuclear umbrella if we're using the strategic depth. We need to go for that, which brings the nuclear facilities online for striking, which are not so easy to strike, especially the ones where the uranium enrichment happens for weapons. They're built inside of mountains, deep underground um so so it's it's maybe there'll be a cyber weapon in 2010 um the cia and Mossad had developed a the world's first cyber weapon stuxnet um and president obama authorized it to be used against natan's uranium enrichment facility in iran and it completely derailed the uranium enrichment while he was negotiating a nuclear deal, you know, it gave him leverage, I think. So he authorized its use. But so we'll have to see if there's cyber weapons launched at that. But it's possible that there'll be an escalation. Look, if Israel wants to focus, if Israel's chief goal would be to regime change, then of course they would want to hit the leadership uh, of the country in order to remove their aura of invulnerability and remove any stronghold of fear that may exist. Um, and, of course, the oil, so that they don't have any money to run run their regime. But if the goal of Israel is national security for itself, then it has to hit the nuclear and the military installations. You know, regime change is more oil and leadership, and nuclear and uh, military structure would be more uh, if the top priority of Israel is its security and wants to push back this this power that keeps saying, we want to kill you, we want to destroy you, we want to throw you in the sea, we want to unleash our militias, we want to attack you from seven fronts, which I'm suggesting has this principality behind it. And of course, Michael on the side of Israel, if that's the, what's the goal? If Is judgment coming on the regime finally? Because the first judgment came on the 40th year under Trump, which was a year of judgment. I mean, 40 is a very important number in the Bible. The, the all kinds of the killing of General Soleimani, the pulling out of the JCPOA, and cre created infighting in the country uh, between the political groups, and that infighting has now come to 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 a maximum level. And so there's a, a lot of weakness in the regime. They're fighting against each other. What are they fighting about? They have different theories about how to survive. One group is more into the religious zeal of an end time attack against Israel, and they are the guys that are calling the shots. They are the guys that are throwing the missiles at Israel. They believe in this Mahdaviyat, the, the eschatology of the Shia. And then there is the ones that believe more in the Islamic concept of Hudna, which is like these peace negotiations with your enemy until you're strong enough to, to get, get at them. And those guys tend to be more in the camp of a globalist Marxist uh, Islamist camp. That's the best way I can describe them. Then there's like the IRGC guys who who believe more in a security state and they they like Putin, they're Rus Russia files. So they have these fights among each other as to like, you know, who's who, how, what's the best way to make sure the regime doesn't fall? And they have this huge infighting. The economy is very, very uh, weak because of years of sanctions and massive amounts of corruption that doesn't allow the resources to function and to build a real structure. Um, a small group, the IRGC, you know, controls the economy and, and gives it to their own people, the, the resources, the money that comes in. There is no taxation system, really. Um, so the inflation, as the whole world has experienced inflation since COVID, but in Iran, it's gone through the roof. The The currency is collapsing. It started collapsing in the 40th year when the JCPOA uh, was torn by Donald Trump. Um, the, the, the currency began to collapse and it's been on a straight down. Even when the 200 missiles were just thrown, it has gone down further. Um, 
just to give you an idea, yeah, I mean, it's just it's just collapsing. Like you need 60,000 units to get a US dollar in a country where nearly everything is imported. Manufacturing is very low other than, you know, uh, animal products and, and agricultural products. Everything is imported. You have to buy it from China. You have to buy it from Dubai. You have to buy it in US dollars. And so you have to pay more. So, of course, the guy who own, owns a business and sells, you know, sells just he has like a supermarket and he sells like milk and, you know, stuff that are even made in the country. He has to sell it for more because he has to get more money from his customers because the cost of living is going up for him. So um, the I, I think that when, you know, Trump pulled out of the JCPOA, um, you got around two three thousand units gave you a us dollar and now you're at sixty thousand units since 2018 so the money's just been going down in value inflation up unemployment is over 10 percent. the government is infighting within itself they were not ready for kind of a full-on war with israel they were building their military technology their regional alliances their air force their they they have reached out to china for satellite technology they were they i think that senwar who or hanye whoever launched october 7th may have maybe i'm just making this up but maybe they they kind of you know jumped the gun the idea was for for you know to launch both from the north and the south the idea was for the Islamic Republic to get a lot more beefed up militarily um, and economically. And suddenly they find themselves in this war where Israel quickly identified them as being the ringmasters, started to take down boldly their people, accepted stuff that were thrown at them, played along more kind of calmly and patiently to have its global alliances was able to take down Hezbollah, which no one thought that that was going to happen so quickly. The idea was it was going to be a very intense and horrible war. Even I predicted that, but that wasn't at all the way it, it unfolded. The, so so suddenly, suddenly they were surprised. They were on their back foot, and Israel is bringing the war to them before they're ready. So maybe God wanted you know, a weakening of this in jihadi system and a collapse because Iran is a trend-setting nation of the world. Christianity is exploding. The Holy Spirit is very active. And should should this darkness fall, it will change the entire Middle East and give a season of reprieve, you know, for, for all kinds of great things to be brought in before the next stage of, of the war. We know prophetically that there's going to be a lot more birth pangs leading ultimately to to a to essentially a third world war you know centered around Jerusalem because if you look at the first world war it 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 toppled the Ottoman Caliphate that controlled Israel the Holy Land and Jerusalem and it gave it into the hand of the British the second world war the Holocaust and all that brought together the circumstances that gave birth to the state of Israel with a strong foundation of people that were really really eager to build a nation, and now the Third World War brings in the Messianic Kingdom. This is really the story of this land, is the story of three world wars. So on the way to that final climax, where the Prince of Peace comes to still the storm and usher in a utopia, we still have a lot. But there could be moments of reprieve, because think about the gospel spreading, think about what's happening to Jewish people right now, a new generation you know, 80 years nearly has been the state of Israel and the lifespan in Israel is, in eight, is 80 years. And now the new generation is so, suddenly October 7th has 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 rekindled the fire of Zionism and the focus on, on returning to the land, of making Aliyah, of really standing up for the state of Israel. The necessity of it has so, become so much more clear to this new generation because of the global anti-Semitism that you're, you're not really safe anywhere unless you're in your own country. And the new generation, with the demographic change in Israel, is drawing more from the Bible for its understanding of its relationship to that land, and rather than from the secular, socialist, atheist, you know, the foundations of, of the state of Israel went back to these, uh, you know, um, um, uh, socialist Zionists. Um, but but the new Zionism that's the, of the next generation, so there is like the Valley of Dry Bones. There is a there is a re reorientation gradually to the very God that brought the land to life and and the and the cities. You know that it's interesting that Israel originally in 1948 was a dry arid place, 
And somehow it became completely through agricultural genius, a land full of, you know, water and, and agriculture to the point where Israel has become an expert. And now people from all around the world go and study. And Iran, a land full of like rivers and has become completely dry. And there's major, major water problems in Iran right now on a national level that's even causing people to leave towns in the south and move more to the center. But as the water dries out in the center, they will have to move to the north. And they need Israel. That's why the crown prince, when he went to Israel, he went and visited all of the water facilities. Iran needs the technology and understanding of Israel to re animate its water system so it's as though if, if the land is an allegory for blessing and curse when it's dead and desolate it's a curse has fallen on the land when the land comes to life it's a blessing has appeared well as is as the government of iran become more and more adamant about the destruction of israel it's as though a curse fell on the land um and and there's tons of stories i could tell you about like there was these protests in isfahan where this major river goes through this town that was instrumental in creating that city. It's the second largest city of Iran. And, and when people came to protest and they walked on the dried river, in their protest, they were saying, the blessing has left us. This is what they were saying. And the reason they were saying that is because they were, they were kind of targeting the clergy that runs the country, saying, guys, if you guys are the representatives of God, and then why is the river going dry? This was kind of they're taking a shot at them in the internal language of, of 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 the culture where everyone understood, you know, what they were saying and to who and what they it meant. They were taking a shot at their like, you know, central legitimacy is these, you know, these representatives of God. It's like really, well, why is the river going dry? So it was taking it was like hitting the bullseye of where they draw their ultimate, you know, legitimacy to be the rulers of the land under their theocracy. So regardless, there's so the people then, you know, as, as the, the land comes into revival, the people gradually get a spiritual revival. And that's a process. The blinding is removed on the very year 1967, where Jerusalem becomes part of the Commonwealth, the Messianic movement begins. And now, since October 7, there's been a tremendous amount of spiritual revival among the Jewish people in the sense that the heart is turning more to the things of God. And and everyone in Israel, I would say, and in the diaspora, has moved one step to the right, essentially, whatever that means, more in in the direction of conservatism, and religion, and God, and and study of the Bible, and the keeping of Sabbaths, and you know, many people who don't attend synagogue even on the Day of Atonement, which is the holiest days. If anybody, it's like Easter and Christmas. If nobody attends the religious institution, they'll do it on the Day of Atonement. But but there are people who still didn't do it. Now this year they did. And so there is there is this spiritual transformation and a blessing coming, and that can continue and expand in the Middle East if the dark forces of jihad are coming out of the Islamic Republic are diminished. It might create a time of revival and peace. And before the next wave of birth pangs, you have to put yourself in the position of the people that are in the epicenter of it. They need a break as well. They need Sabbaths. They need good news as well. They can't just be in the middle of like one birth pang after another, right? So this could be, could it be that Israel's strikes now create, exasperate the revolution? How could it go from here? So first of all, the four categories that I mentioned, there might be some you know, horse trading with the United States as to like, oh, should we hit the nuclear, the oil? So I suspect that that the military installations and the leadership are going to be the first, you know, strikes. But I think that that Iran will respond and that by the time this war kind of comes to its climax, I think all four categories will be hit. It'll just be a matter of escalation, of justification. For instance, if they decide to go for the nuclear as they're losing the militias, Israel will now have a clear legitimate reason and, and 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 you know many people in the world be like yes we don't want these guys to have a nuke right now so so we'll have to see how it plays out um, as far as what would happen internally in the country as these strikes begin which I suspect there's going to be a lot of intelligence operations because they have people on the ground that are collaborating with them from the opposition we saw that's the the killing of the leader of Hamas in an IRGC barrack clearly pointed to that connection. You know, you can't get into that barrack. There's security after security and passes codes. And I, I don't know, whatever you have to do to click the doors and go in. Like, it's not like 
You can't you can't get there and put a bomb under his bed just because you know you bribe the cleaning lady. Like it doesn't work that way. Um, and now we know that Israel has remote detonation capabilities that are high. We saw that with the pagers and raiders they blew up in Lebanon. So, so basically, um, these um, uh, there there's going to be sabotage, cyber weapons, assassinations, maybe so help from the inside and air air strikes as well. But you have to understand that that Iran is not only far, but fifteen hundred miles from Israel, but also or fifteen hundred kilometers. But also, it's a very big country. If you took um, Poland, Germany, and France, and you stuck them together, you still don't have Iran. Iran is bigger than the combined surface of Poland, Germany, and France. It, you know, when you get to Mesopotamia, the land of Shinar, where the sons of Noah rekindle the first cities after the flood, there you have a huge mountain chain that is the entire length of the country, which is twelve to 15,000 feet high. And then you have another mountain chain by the Caspian Sea, like an L, that's also twelve to 15,000 feet high. And then you have this plateau that's 10,000 feet high, which is Iran, descending towards the Persian Gulf all the way from up there, from the mountains. It's not it's not so easy to strike. It's not like the like the as the a smaller Arab countries in the plain. It's a big country. It's mountainous. They have built a lot of these, you know, their military installations where they keep their missiles and um, their uh, their nuclear facilities deep, deep in the ground in the mountains. Calculated, you know, how far the bunker busters can strike, and then gone below that, so, and then they've built it. They've built concrete under the mountain and then they've housed their technology in there. So, you know, if you're going to hit it, it's not like one quick strike and boom, boom. Of course, if you have angels helping you, that's a different story. But the point is that there will be aerial strikes, but don't underestimate other things like cyber weapons and intelligence operations. So what would this, what would effect would this have in the country? Well, first of all, I think that definitely will exasperate the forces of revolution. There is no doubt about that. As I said, the revolution began in 2022. It will tip the scale in that direction. Then how fast could that gather to actually become a real revolution and topple the government and all that stuff? Depends on a few things. Depends, first of all, we have to see what they strike. You know, is it going to be a soft strike? Is it going to be like, you know, you take a punch on the chin and you think, look, I'd rather just put my head down and then you 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 know you call for the for the planet to get involved and say guys you know we, we want to sign some sort of a ceasefire because uh, uh this can get out of hand we we know we're going to take this on the chin but you know and 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 maybe Israel will say okay then release the hostages and maybe they'll they'll want to do that to save themselves or will the strike be so heavy that they'll have to respond because if they don't the floodgates will open internally and their militias will lose faith in them and, and their response will require more response from Israel. And now the four target categories that I mentioned are now going to come online gradually. And the more and more the people inside are going to realize, wow, these guys are really taking a huge hit. And that makes them more courageous. So if the revolutionary force that rises as a result of the strikes, so at first we have to see how big the strikes are going to be, what they're going to hit whether it's going to escalate to a larger series of strikes. Then we have to see whether this creates enough of a popular wave to come out for the opposition group under mainly the crown prince. He's the main opposition leader. There are other ones, but he's the main one with the, with the, with the largest network. For him to open up his network, which is secret and all through the country, and for the people that are in the government that are willing to take arms against their bosses and in the uh, IRGC and the military and, I, and ideological police, for them to do that, you know, they say if you're going to take a shot at the king, you better not miss. They would only do all of those things if they saw a clear path to victory. Uh, so either there's huge popular support where millions of people have come in the streets and are not leaving the streets, where these guys feel they can now take that step. And the crown prince made a speech recently um, just a few days ago saying, you know, that he's ready to do his duty as a transitional leader and then organize a, a college, a, a group of uh, experts who will uh, put forward different political uh, structures such as a republic, a democracy, a kingdom, or a constitutional monarchy like the Great Britain. 
and that people can have a referendum and go out and vote and see which 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 system they want. So he, so he stepped out with that message, which is something. It's a unique message that he has never put out. So so yes, he's maybe he's getting he's getting ready that this could be it. So there could be huge pop, or maybe it becomes more of a gradual process. It becomes, you know, an acceleration of the momentum that has started in 2022 with the death of Masa Amini and the revolutionary spirit. But maybe it becomes more of a gradual process. People start to realize something's going on. The strikes are effective. It, it kind of tilts the spirit of the nation in that direction. But the, the opposition and the people that are going to be the leaders of this movement and make it happen may not want to reveal themselves as long as they feel that the global structure continues to give this the ayatollahs of iran oxygen if, if the united states continues to put money in a suitcase and send it to them or as under the biden administration they've received a huge amount of you know economic support that's given them a second wind and and allowed them to carry these wars against Israel, starting with the first Gaza war at the beginning of Biden's presidency, and now the second one. If if the opposition feels, look, what if Kamala Harris wins in the United States and and continues to give them support, they they might feel that in order for them to really reveal their themselves and go for the the jugular, go for the supreme leader, and and go for for toppling him, they would need either massive popular support to be ignited or they would need to see a double-edged sword where Netanyahu leads the military strikes that weaken the government and then a change of presidency is needed in the United States where Trump comes to power and is will more willing to cut the oxygen to them and Russia may then pull back from supporting them in order to make a deal in Ukraine or may not have a choice because it doesn't have the leverage. I don't know. We'll have to see. And I think whether right now this morning when Israel has entered Damascus, entered Syria by infantry units, 500 um, uh, meters of Syrian territory, half a kilometer, um, that may be the beginning of the of the Bashar Assad regaining his independence from, from Iran. And, and he's been dying to do that as the Iranian militias get weakened by Israel, and if, if Iran loses Syria and Lebanon, then I think the world order might see it Israel's way and say, okay, especially if Trump wins. So the opposition in the country may want to see the double whammy of a military uh, uh, strikes by Israel and a, a political withdrawal from the global order under Trump's leadership. And, and then the opposition might finally see that, okay, oxygen is being cut from them globally and they are being weakened internally by these strikes. And now more and more people may start to come out and they may they may encourage it because now they see a shot to victory. They're getting judged. Judgment is falling on them from both sides, globally and from Israel. And I mean, ultimately from God. But you know what I mean? Like mechanically, like it manifests in these in these ways in our world. And so we'll have to see how this goes, but this war could very well carry into 2025. Um, and maybe this, yes, it could very well result in the toppling of the Islamic Republic uh, of Iran and the collapse of their militias and, and Shia Crescent. And the very country that launched this war against Israel has been saying they want to destroy Israel, judgment may fall on them and the people might be freed, receiving the blessing that is maybe owed to them from the the ancient uh, blessing that the Persians gave to the Jewish people out of all the various diasporas, the various empires. They are the ones that bless this world. Now they the people may receive that blessing, and the and the curse may fall on the government who, under this Islamic view, has 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 considers Israel as the. Uh, manifestation of a cancelled religion because Islam is now the ultimate religion that replaces the previous uh, ones, the Bible, and therefore Israel has no place. There's no prophecies of ingathering. There's no messianic kingdom. There's no plan of redemption. There's no tabernacle of King David that's fallen, that's rising. None of that exists in that perspective. It's seen as a negative thing that is an aberration that should just be destroyed. So a judgment falls on the spirit that's taken the scepter of Persia frees the people who receive the blessing 
And this strike that is about to happen as I'm putting this video out, maybe the really the the beginning of this process that I'm, you know, uh, speculating about and, and saying we're going to see it together and I'll keep talking about it as it unfolds. Um, if you found this, uh, if you like this, please um, share it, you know, with your friends and family um, and uh, put it on your own social media. And also, if you want to follow me on Twitter, it's um, at UFOs, Angels, Gods, one word, at UFOs, Angels, Gods, one word, uh, I, the iconoclast. And also, um, you know, uh, support me on Patreon uh, as you get more videos and at least I'm working on really building up the Patreon page. So if, if you want to join that, you can do that. The website is thinkagainproductions.com. I hope that this message blesses you. And we'll see whether this is a time of judgment and a time of blessing all at once. Till next time.